Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim and Assalamu alaikum guys. Um, this lecture is seriously jinxed. It's lecture four. And um, I recorded this for like four hours last night. I've been trying to edit it all morning. Um, one of my cameras overheated. Another camera had audio issues and my computer didn't pick up audio either. And so I don't know, I was babbling for four hours without any anything to show for it. Then I started recording this lecture and um, audio still wasn't working. So hopefully uh, this this time, third time should be lucky. Um, let's start with a recap of the classes that we've studied so far. Um, we talked first about uh, this idea of how it is that economists make predictions. And I said that we base most of our uh, predictions on and the idea of rationality as the underpinning of the model by which we predict human behavior. Of course, humans are unpredictable um, and you can't say with certainty what they'll do. But having um, the idea that uh, making the assumption that we take logical actions to achieve consistent objectives allows us to make uh, some predictions. And of course, they'll be inaccurate to a degree. But what economists have found is that they tend to work uh, more than more than not. Um, next, um, we talked about prescriptions or the normative side of economics. And I said that uh, we have these different concepts of efficiency, um, but that they are limiting because, um, as you'll remember, um, when we talked about Pareto uh, solutions, Pareto is the idea of uh, win-wins um, being tapped or used. Um, we said that because there are minor losses in any policy, um, it's very hard to argue that a Pareto improvement is possible, which by definition means that the situation you're in, your status quo is Pareto optimal. And that was what we meant when we said that many things are Pareto optimal. Right? Um, having said this, the next um, idea of efficiency was Calvert Hicks, and we said that um, this is just the idea of um, having uh, of maximizing the dollar value of social resources. Uh, where what that means exactly, the dollar value of social resources is up for debate, and it also suffers the problem of um, not saying anything about distribution. So as long as you're maximizing that dollar value, uh, you are going to, uh, you, you are Caldor Hicks efficient. Um, Caldor Hicks has been described as potentially Pareto efficient because arguably if you increase the size of the pie, the redistribution is possible. But of course, that doesn't take into account things like politics. So if we give too much uh, power or money uh, to one party, then other parties might not um, be able to challenge any new rules, for example, that that party wants to set. Um, there's also the question of philosophical problems with, for example, over, um, over allocating resources to one party creating a very skewed distribution. Um, so today's lecture is really about the foundations of economics in the sense that we want to discuss why it is that trade or voluntary exchange between parties um, creates value. And so to start, let's think about how the economy can grow without producing more. So when we think of economic growth, we typically think of industries and we think of um, sort of workers, labor uh, working towards producing either more goods or on the farm producing crops or um, in the service sector producing, sort of using their skills to produce, uh, for example, uh, different various, various sorts of services. Um, but it's also possible to improve the economy or to grow the economy without producing more. And um, to understand this, first you have to realize that ultimately the value of something lies in its use. 
right? Any, uh, any item can have a price tag in the store, but whether or not A, it's bought at that price and B, whether it creates value for the consumer is really what the ultimate objective of, uh, of any economy or any production is. So imagine a scenario where a vegetarian and a meat lover both walk into a restaurant and the waiter mixes up their orders. So the vegetarian gets meat and the meat lover gets vegetables. In this case, what's happened is that you've got the right product, but by virtue of it being allocated wrong, you've got, um, you've got both parties unhappy and so the obvious solution is to switch dishes. So then both parties are, are happier, right? Um, and so what this says is that as long as you're getting your allocations wrong, production doesn't really matter. Or conversely, if you are able to improve allocations that um, with a finite amount of production, with a given production, not a finite production, but a given amount of production, you are then able to um, improve outcomes or improve welfare for people. Now, trade fundamentally depends on the coincidence or the coexistence of wants, right? So if I'm going to trade with you, I want, let's say, um, you know, an item that you own and you want the money that I'm going to give you. Um, and that sort of um, Without both parties having that, uh, having those wants, we can't trade. But if we do have those those wants and those wants are compatible, um, then trade is possible. So one example of this is um, kids' toy swaps. Um, so in some places there are these events where kids and their parents come in with their old toys. They've used a lot. They're getting bored off, and then they're able to just swap with one another um, or people might have video games at home that you're tired of playing and you just meet up and you swap your video games let's say or I'm a big car nut so uh, especially in the US or England um, with classic cars uh, there are uh, these swap, show, swap shows or swap drives where um, people will meet up with their old cars now Old cars have the property that their parts are very hard to find. Um, they are not being produced anymore. The ones that exist might be low quality. So when you find a good part, even if it's not of your car, uh, there's a culture of grabbing those parts and keeping them. And then when people meet up, so I've been saving up, let's say, parts for this BMW. Um, and you have been saving up parts for um, a Ford, let's say a Ford Mustang. And we both meet up at the same place and then we're able to trade. In this case, uh, in this poster, there is a specific car that uh, they're meeting up for. So maybe I have a radiator that I found somewhere, but I already have a good radiator. I've kept that and you kept a fender and you kept that and we meet up. And uh, by, uh, by just swapping, we're able to improve outcomes for one another. So again, no production, we're just trading on existing goods, but by allocating these things better, we're creating value. Closer to home, uh, especially for those of you who belong to Islamabad or Rawalpindi, there's a big culture of old books, uh, old bookshops. Old bookshops are the perfect example of the creation of value without production, in the sense that um, you will have books that already exist in the economy, and they're brought to one place, people presumably when they sell books are happy with the price they're getting and presumably when they buy books are happy with the price that they're getting. That price of course must be higher because then that's how you keep these shops open. And just by virtue of, well, I don't really need what I have. I give it to uh, the shop and just by this person 
being the interface in some sense or the coordinator between those who value the book less and those who value the book more, they are creating real value in the economy such that if they are not available, then your allocation of books in the economy uh, deteriorates. Right? Now of course, what is the extent, what is the commercial extent of the value created? Um, that's that's a question mark. And so what's happening, especially if for those of you who are familiar again with Islamabad, there are a lot of these shops in, um, in uh, I believe, what's the, Jinnah Super, I think. And in Rawalpindi, there's Sadar Bazaar, uh, which where there are these clusters of, of old booksellers. Um, especially in Islamabad, where real estate values have gone up, these shops, which aren't making that much money, at the end of the day, compared to let's say um, one of these lawn companies or uh, a cafe or something, in this in this really prime location, can't make enough money to pay rent because the value that they're creating is is there, but it commercially perhaps they're not earning as much profit as they need um, accounting profit um, to to stay in to stay in business because they are not able to cover their rent. Um, and so unfortunately we are seeing a decline of these uh, sort of businesses. Another uh, s sort of um, con context specific example is uh, Landa Bazaar. And if you look at, um, uh, so, so what Landa is, is uh, a place where people bring old clothes uh, to sell but also buy uh, old clothes that these sellers have brought in from other places, including from abroad. Um, they represent quite a significant uh, sort of place for a greater, um, for, for better allocations of, um, of, um, of, of these resources, especially for uh, lower income uh, people. Uh, this is, by the way, I'll, I'll send you the link to both this and another video uh, that I've embedded in this uh, lecture. These are both videos that are worth, uh, so especially this one has the interesting thing that a lot of people have commented on Landa Bazaar and you should watch this and then we should discuss um, sort of whether the logic of your uh, layperson is consistent with what we as economists know uh, to be true. Um, and that, that should make for an interesting discussion that we'll have uh, perhaps over Zoom one day. Um, so the bottom line is that trade enables allocative efficiency when the old shoe or the old book flows from the person who values it less to the person who values it more, you get uh, better allocations. Um, in the economy, there are two concepts of efficiency. The first is this allocative efficiency, the other is productive efficiency and we'll come to that later in the lecture. Under certain assumptions, um, we'll, and then we'll talk a little bit about what those assumptions are, voluntary exchange, where I'm not being forced to trade with you, but we are trading, um, allows the economy's resources to be allocated more efficiently. And to understand this, we have to get into a little bit of theory um, with the Edgeworth box. So the Edgeworth box, so before we talk about the Edgeworth box, let's talk a little bit about um, a number line. So consider this, imagine that you have a, a number line of um, in this case, a length of four and you have one person on one end and another person on the other end. And so where you place, um, let's, okay, so where you place your coordinate describes the allocations for both parties. From A's perspective, he has one unit, so the numbers above are from his perspective um, and for B, he has three. So there are four total, let's call them, let's say there are four pens that you have to distribute between yourself and your friend. Um, 
at this allocation, let us say that you are A and they are B, um, you have one pen and that person has three. If they take your last pen, you have zero and they have four, two, two, you have three and they have one or you have four and they have none, right. So as long as the length of this line is fixed or finite, one point is enough to depict allocations between two people. So to go further, let us um, think about this. Um, you have got here um, again similar straight line and now this is a line of size 10 and so different points on the line will depict allocations between two people in this case A and B. So keep this logic in mind and what we will do with the edge of the box is make two such lines, um, one on the sort of one horizontal and one vertical and we will use them to construct a box in which we will put indifference curves. So how does that work? Um, your normal indifference curve looks, looks, looks like this and Jeffrey is the person that uh, we are going to talk about in this example as one of the parties involved, likes both apples and raspberries and uh, his preferred points are of course uh, because they are both goods, um, more of either or both makes Jeffrey happier and he will have one a point which is his preferred uh, point uh, right. So there is uh, I am sorry not his preferred point but his allocation this is the amount that he has. Now imagine that we just flip this graph right um, and so imagine that we have another indifference curve exactly like this for our second person whose, whose name is Elizabeth. But now instead of keeping it the way um, it was for Jeffrey, we are going to flip it and so Elizabeth, Elizabeth's origin is on the top right, the zero that you see there and for her higher indifference curves from her perspective because she is upside down are from our perspective on the slide lower into the left. This is the first thing that you have to understand, right. Um, in other words, keep in mind that Elizabeth's indifference curves will move in the opposite direction from Jeffrey's in this case. So if we now were to bring Elizabeth's graph down and we um, line up the two orange points together, <coughs> we get this. Now think about why we did this. Elizabeth has, let us say, um, she has two apples and let us say Jeffrey has eight. A number line that we make vertically of size 10 and we are from Jeffrey's perspective it is his allocation point is 8 units up and for Elizabeth's upside down perspective it is 2 units down. That one point is enough to describe the allocation of apples between Jeffrey and Elizabeth. Similarly for raspberries, let us say that Jeffrey has um, 3 and um, Elizabeth has 7 raspberries. A horizontal line where we put the point on the third unit is enough to describe both the fact that Jeffrey has 3 units of raspberries and that Elizabeth has 7 units. And so if we now construct a box that is 10, 10 in size, 10 apples and 10 raspberries in this economy, this one point that we have is enough to describe the allocation of both. Now keep in mind that physically um, any move sort of any allocation, any this orange dot could move anywhere in this box and that would be a technically feasible allocation. What does that mean? So you've got 10 apples and 10 raspberries. Imagine that they're on the floor in front of you, right? And why would it be on the floor? On the table in front of you. And you're Elizabeth and Jeffrey sitting in front of you. 
Now, between the two of you, let's say that we um, we put a line in the middle of the table. Now you could move those apples and raspberries either side of the line. They would still be 10 apples and 10 raspberries on the table, right? You're never going to have, unless someone brought them in from inside, outside, which we're assuming away, this is, this is it. You've got 10 apples and 10 raspberries. And so, on, in this sort of representation, um, you should be able to see that if we were to move, let's say, to Jeffrey's origin, he had 0, 0. And from Elizabeth's perspective, that is 10, 10. She gets everything. Jeffrey gets nothing. If you move along the edge to the right, to the right lower corner, that means all the raspberries are with Jeffrey and all the apples are with Elizabeth. You move up. And in the top right corner, Elizabeth gets nothing, Jeffrey gets everything. Top left corner, um, Elizabeth gets all the raspberries and Jeffrey gets all the apples. And so anywhere in here, a certain number of, Je uh, a certain number of apples and raspberries go to Jeffrey and the remainder 10 minus Jeffrey's allocation is with Elizabeth. So that's, that's this concept. Um, so the dimensions of the box are the combined quantities available of the goods. All points inside the box are technically feasible. And now the interesting question comes in. Uh, but before I move on, often uh, my students in the past have struggled with understanding that um, there is always at one time only going to be one allocation. So on this graph, you always conceptually want to think of first the allocation, the orange dot, and then the indifference curves. If you get your, so sometimes people will draw, <coughs> excuse me, um, the two uh, indifference curves, but they won't connect them in this way. And they'll have two different allocations. And that's just not possible uh, with a finite Edgeworth box of the sort that we're describing here. And then the Edgeworth box by definition is finite. Um, so now the interesting question, which points are Pareto improvements, which points represent win-wins. So let's think about this. And now I said that there can only be one orange dot at a time. There can be only one allocation at a time. The lighter orange or the yellow dot here is the move. So you're with, at one time, it's, you're either on the orange dot or on the yellow dot, not on both. But the Edgeworth box will always have only one allocation. Now, if you move, Let's focus on the graph on the top left. If you're moving from the orange dot there to the yellow dot, Elizabeth is made no better off and no worse off because she, she's indifferent between, by definition, indifferent between orange and yellow in this case. But Jeffrey is made much, much better off. Similarly, go below the top left, uh, the bottom left, and now with that new yellow placement, uh, Jeffrey is made no better off and Elizabeth is being made better off. So these are both Pareto improvements. One party is being made better off without making another party worse off. How about a move to the left and down as shown in the top right uh, graph? Um, here, both parties are being made better off. But yet, if you were to, let's say that you were to delete the solid blue and green here and make the blue and green dashed lines solid, right? You'd be back to the same sort of a graph and a further improvement is still possible. And you keep doing these improvements until, as you see on the bottom right graph, these indifference curves become back to back. Why? Because now, before this, when you had in the top uh, right uh, corner the move that we showed there, these, the interests of Jeffrey and Elizabeth were converging. Both parties were being made better off. The, remember that <clears throat> we still had just 10 apples and uh, 10 uh, raspberries. But by Jeffrey giving some um, apples to Elizabeth and 
Elizabeth returning some the favor with some raspberries to Jeffrey in a certain ratio, they were both being made um, better off, right? So keep in mind that in the in all of these graphs, what's happening is that um, Elizabeth is giving up some raspberries and uh, Jeffrey is giving up some apples. But the difference is what is the ratio, how many, right? Um, both parties are being made better off. Um, now, when that move was happening in the top right corner, their interests were converging, they were both improving. But now at the allocation shown on the in the bottom right, any sort of because uh, both parties are maximizing their utility with this um, with this allocation, any move away from this will either hurt one party or hurt both. Um, how will it hurt both? Think again of reversing this, so going from the yellow to the orange and you have decreased both, um, both allocations. Now, um, something that I haven't shown here uh, is Let's see. Okay. Um, wh what would happen if we move from here to there? So you have Jeffrey giving up some raspberries um, to get some apples. Now, if you moved here, you would be on worse indifference curve still. What would happen if um, now there was a move here? Now, a, a move in this direction is making Elizabeth better off but is not is making Jeffrey definitely worse off. So a move like this would be blocked by Jeffrey in any voluntary exchange. Elizabeth would have to hold a gun to Jeffrey's head to make him accept a move from here to here because clearly his indifference curve would be uh, lower there. Okay. Um, and so this entire region here under the blue curve would be blocked by Jeffrey. And similarly, everything that is from Elizabeth's perspective lower than this green curve or from our perspective higher would be blocked by Elizabeth. Um, and so, this region represents um, improvements, Pareto improvements um, if you have this orange point as your uh, initial allocation. Um, now where though within that space will you go? Will you go here or there or here? And the answer is, um, well let's look at the answer. So let's say that you move from this point to this point. Jeffrey's indifference curve improves, Elizabeth's um, indifference curve also improves. Um, and Pareto improvements are still possible. So you keep moving such moves, I'm not going to draw the, the shaded region every time. Keep making those moves until you reach a point where those indifference curves are back to back. This uh, point of back-to-back -back indifference curves is Pareto optimal. There is no improvement possible from this point. And it is the one, um, well, let me, let me hold that thought for a second. Um, is it the only outcome possible from starting point F? The answer is no. You can imagine, um, Remember that indifference curves are infinite. So Jeffrey has billions of these blue um, curves parallel to one or sort of in sort of concentric curves um, like right next to one another all throughout. And similarly Elizabeth has many of these. So there would be a point here where Elizabeth's indifference curve and Jeffrey's are tangential to one another and similarly one here. Um, so 
your um, you could also have within the from starting point f you wouldn't be able to come here even though this is uh, here even though this is a rate of improvement um, I'm sorry that even though this is a Pareto optimal point, you won't come here because it would be blocked by Jeffrey. It would not be a Pareto improvement once Jeffrey is starting from this point. But if Jeffrey was starting here, it might be a Pareto improvement. Um, and similarly, you have multiple of such uh, tangential points. And these sort of Pareto optimal points have the property that the marginal rate of substitution or the rate at which each party is willing to substitute apples for raspberries must be the same for both parties because if they're not, further trade makes sense uh, except in some special cases that I'm not getting into. And if this isn't clear to you why, then um, just think of, well, let's say that, uh, that uh, Jeffrey is willing to trade one apple for one raspberry and as Elizabeth is willing to trade uh, one apple for two raspberries. Okay. Um, so in that case, there is a trade possible because Elizabeth can go to uh, Jeffrey and say, you want one apple for one raspberry. So if I give you one raspberry, you should give me an apple. Jeffrey says, sure, take the apple. And But remember that Elizabeth was willing to give two raspberries for that apple. So she's got something that was worth two raspberries for the price of one raspberry and vice versa. Uh, Jeffrey could make the offer for, um, for raspberries. The point is that um, the rate of substitution must be the same for both parties for them to stop trading. Now, you can draw a curve through all Pareto optimal points that exist within the Edgewell box. And this is called the contract curve. By the, so that is the, just the set of all Pareto efficient scenarios. Now the thing with the contract curve and the thing to understand is that a Pareto efficient point is a, both a general term and has meaning specifically in our context. So what does that mean? Starting from here, we said that this is a Pareto efficient point. It is a Pareto efficient point, but it's not a Pareto improvement. Starting from here, this is a Pareto improvement, this is a Pareto improvement, and this is a Pareto improvement. Okay. And, um, but this point M and this point N represents the maximum, the, the, the least favorable Pareto efficient point um, that Jeffrey is willing to accept because this is Pareto efficient, but it's not a Pareto improvement for Jeffrey or for, well, for Jeffrey given the starting point here. And this is a Pareto efficient point, but it's not a Pareto improvement for Elizabeth given this starting point. Um, so let's take a break here and I will start uh, part two of this lecture in just a bit.